Rob is a certified professional in accessibility core competencies. He's also the strategic accessibility coordinator at WebAIM. Rob has been in the digital accessibility space since 2010. He spent loads of time training, consulting, and learning about digital accessibility on topics large and small. Rob has worked with hundreds of individuals and dozens of organizations on everything from accessibility in a single PDF to integrating accessibility into organizations, digital strategies. And Rob presents at national conferences. He organizes the occasional conference and he tries to be more active and less snarky on LinkedIn. Now this session is going to be a little bit different in that he will be speaking uh, specifically about technology. And I know that many of you are going to have some questions. So if we have time at the end of this session, we're going to open it up for some question and answering. And for those of you that are joining us online, you can put those questions in the chat, that would be great. So with that, Rob, I am glad that you were here with us today. And I now will turn it over to you. Steve, thanks so much. Great to be with you all uh, virtually as it is the case here. Let me go ahead and get some slides up in front of you all. So yeah, Steve, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I really do appreciate the chance to spend part of y'all's Global Accessibility Awareness Day with you. Uh, I am indeed with WebAIM, that's pretty recent. Um, I joined WebAIM just a couple of months ago. Uh, if you're not familiar with WebAIM, we are based out of the Institute for Disability Research Policy and Practice at Utah State University. I tell people I'm now WebAIM South and East because I'm actually working remotely in Oklahoma. Uh, WebAIM does custom and off-the-shelf training. We do digital accessibility evaluation work. We do a fair amount of consulting and kind of the way Steve introduced me is, is actually similar to the range of topics that we cover at WebAIM. We do everything from really techie stuff to helping people with Microsoft Office to project planning and procurement and acquisition and so on and so forth. If you're interested in finding out more about what we do or really just finding out more about digital accessibility, you can hop on to www.webaim.org. That's W-E-B-A-I-M.org. And I'll have some links later on to some of our resources as well. Um, I will say about WebAIM, I followed them since I got into digital accessibility and they were my jumping off point uh, to really end up where I am now. So I'm thrilled to be here uh, on their behalf. Um, I think we covered the, the question piece. If you do have a question, a burning question, feel free to ask just as we're going. We should have some time near the end as well, um, but I don't mind being interrupted to field questions. And again, if you are uh, participating as I am on Zoom, then feel free to drop those into the chat and someone will read them aloud. So we'll set the stage a little bit. Um, before the pandemic, I may or may not be able to join you all at all. I, I really do appreciate Signal Centers uh, having me come in remotely. The plan was originally for me to be there in person. Um, but the job switch changed that up a little bit. I was working at the University of Alabama at Birmingham and was going to make an on-site campus visit in conjunction with a trip out to be with you all uh, in person. So that didn't work out. And again, thank you for letting me come in remotely. Um, but this, this is something that has become so much more familiar. I do remember pre-pandemic going to an event in Washington, D.C., and we had a panel that actually had a, a panelist participate remotely much as I am now. At the time, that was completely new. That was a very novel thing. Uh, we, in my, my job at the time, had used Zoom quite a bit. And so we kind of became the liaison with the hotel venue to figure out how to patch somebody in over Zoom. So it was, it was very rare though, uh, not like now where I think we're very accustomed to using technology. And I remember thinking just about two years ago this time, hey, we'll be back in person, you know, by, by this time, a year, two, whatever time down the road, we would just hit a switch, right, where our engagements would go back to the way they were before, where for the most part, we did stuff in person. Well, sure enough, that hasn't really worked out. So what's on screen now is a, a picture of somebody with a, a garbage bag full of toilet paper in in this time two years ago, uh, it was panic in a lot of ways. I remember in the role that I had at the time, 
we were trying to figure out how to actually take a training that we were scheduled to deliver there in Tennessee and put it all on the internet, put it all through Zoom. Uh, we rescheduled it out until I think it was the fall maybe. And in the midst of this panic, what many of our organizations did, I would say most, is we rapidly just threw everything that we could online in whatever, whatever platform we could find, whatever platform we were kind of sort of familiar with, we just started using them. Uh, I call it a reactive mass digitization. Uh, reactive in that, of course, we couldn't anticipate the world breaking the way it did two years ago. And we couldn't anticipate the way that the majority of our lives became a, a virtual interaction and relied on technology. And in terms of the, the time frame, we went from tangible in-person experiences to virtual interactions within a couple of weeks. Um, my kids at the time were in uh, both in elementary school, and I think that was spring break. And basically what they did is they came home for spring break, and then they were home for several months after that. Even for folks like me who have, were used to working from home, I, I've worked from home for several years now, it was very, very different. Uh, those of you who might have worked remotely before uh, know that your partners, your uh, spouses, your children were there. You were trying to figure out if you were in a setting where you didn't have enough devices for everybody. Well, how do we provide devices for everybody? And for those of us who had been working with some of these platforms and technologies like Zoom, we were suddenly Zoom consultants. Everything changed because of this reactive mass digitization. So two years later, and much like this climber, uh, rock climber who is looking up at a climbing wall planning a route, we've got some time. We have some time to slow down a bit and to plan what we're doing with our technology. We've had time and, and now have a bit more to take a look at what has worked and what hasn't worked for us and for the people that we serve, that we engage with on these different interactions. So hopefully one of the things that we're doing both as individuals contributing to our organization's work and even more so, I hope that organizations broadly are beginning to really look at the quality of the digital stuff that remains, the quality of the digital interactions that we continue to rely on now. And very much, I believe that accessibility in our websites, in our software, in our mobile apps, I think that accessibility is without question a very good indicator of the quality of those products, the quality of those interactions. So as, as we do have this bit more time and we have seen what works and what doesn't, I very much encourage everyone to consider accessibility when you're looking at what's out there whether it's a, a Facebook page that you have, streaming on Facebook Live, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk about some specific examples here in just a moment. Um, one of the things that I think is kind of interesting about the way that this has all morphed is that now we have folks who are going back to the workplace physically. They're going back to school or have been going back to school uh, in person. Uh, and in a lot of cases, we're still, we're still meeting people on Zoom. I have read quite a bit and heard quite a bit anecdotally about people finding it kind of amusing that they have gone back to their office to spend most of their day meeting with people on Zoom. On one hand, as I've said before, we are getting more used to these interactions at this point, and, and we have kind of settled in as much as maybe we're going to, to dealing with technology in front of us all the time. But if we have a hybrid team, then we're going to continue to use Zoom or Teams or some of these different platforms to uh, engage with people. And there's a tremendous opportunity with these digital interactions and just with uh, making it so that people can more freely work from home. Prior to the pandemic, working from home, if somebody requested an accommodation based on their having a disability and that accommodation request was to work from home, many, many employers would shut that down. Oh, you can't possibly work from home for X, Y, Z reasons. We had this, this massive pilot with our mass uh, digitization where a lot of us were working from home and did so very successfully. So there are tremendous opportunities. There are opportunities like this one. Again, I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of your program and honored to be a part of the program today. And the way that I could continue to participate and be a part of it was for me to participate remotely. 
Now, I have to acknowledge the value of in-person interactions. Uh, and obviously, obviously, there are some settings where you do need to be in person at the workplace, in person at, at school, possibly. The value of in-person interactions was just kind of, I guess I was reminded about it at a recent event where I met my boss in person for the first time since I got hired at WebAIM and one of my coworkers as well. We were at an event and in an hour, we advanced the conversation that we've been having on Slack and on Zoom over the last several weeks. We probably advanced it, oh, I don't know, another several weeks because we had about an hour where we just talked about work and we came out with action plans and next steps. So I don't want to take away from the value of in-person but technology gives us a tremendous opportunity. What's on screen now is uh, just like an over-the-shoulder shot of someone on something like a Zoom call. There are several panels and, and smiling faces uh, on the other end on the laptop screen that's on this uh, table. So there's a part of me, too, that thinks if your team is actually spread out, and even if you're just spread out in a metropolitan area, then uh, if, you're, if you're finding time to meet and making room for uh, places to meet in person, there's a fair amount of effort in terms of time and money and, and gas that goes into that. Even getting into a conference room on a large educational or corporate campus building can take a fair amount of effort. So then we again see that Zoom can be very helpful for on-site. Uh, my wife works in a school district not too far away from us, and she works in several schools in the district providing physical therapy services to a, a whole wide range of kiddos. And for her, if she has a meeting uh, across town, right when she's finishing up with one of the kids on her case uh, load, it's really great that she can still jump on and participate via Zoom. So we have definitely seen some pretty familiar brands, or I guess I should say some brands have become much more familiar. And, and I want you to think about uh, the, these in the context of accessibility. When we talk about digital accessibility, it is a really broad, big conversation. Ultimately, all of the technology we put in front of the audiences that we serve and engage with, we, we need to account for accessibility when we decide indeed what to put in front of them and how we put it out there. But brands such as Facebook Live have become much more common and prevalent and well-known for civic uh, interactions, for social activities. Uh, Facebook Live was a, a huge part of our lives, more than likely, uh, at the early part of the pandemic. And again, I think it's, it's one that has stuck. It's something that we continue to use. Certainly, Zoom, which brings me to you all today and allows for remote participation as well uh, with some of the audience participating on Zoom. Uh, Zoom is outrageously, outrageously familiar to many of us now in a way that we certainly would not have thought that it would be uh, three years ago. We have tools like Microsoft Office, Office 365 and Google Suite that let you jump out and you can, you can collaborate and work on a single document or a presentation all remotely. You can leave comments and you can actually see when someone types into a Word document online or a Google Docs document, you can see them typing. I've been in several remote meetings where people use Google Docs as a way to um, take role and you just type your name in and everyone types their name into the same list. So no one has to actually look through the participant list on Zoom or actually take role. It's done there in Google Docs. And then for many of us, Slack has also been a, a huge part of our lives. For myself, I'm not on that many Slack workspaces. Many of you might be on 10, 12, uh, but it is for remote and hybrid teams, a fantastic way for us to just have those quick, what would be stick your head in office kind of conversation or question via Slack, via that platform. We have seen a lot of product creators. So Facebook, Zoom, Microsoft, the parent company of Slack, we have seen a lot of these incorporate accessibility much more prominently into these platforms. And that's come because we've realized that a lot of these platforms are lacking. It's, this has happened because a lot of organizations have realized that, oh, this accessibility thing extends into our digital environments as well. Now, it's not true across the board. Not every single entity out there has really taken a lot of strides to make a more accessible product, but 
we've definitely seen in the last two years more emphasis placed on digital accessibility. Even then, it can still be a little bit spotty, but we have at least seen, I think, a trend where organizations, large and small, are attending to accessibility uh, much more effectively than they had been prior to the pandemic. So I just want to pause, actually, uh, and, and see what questions you all might have. It seems like a good time to aggregate some questions, possibly. And then we'll get into what accessibility really means. Okay, very good. So with all that kind of stage setting, what does a more accessible thing actually do? Uh, well, I think that if we, if we begin to engage accessibility, one of the things that I hope very much happens is we as individuals and organizations think more about how people actually use our digital stuff. We think more carefully about what's important to people, what is important to us to get in front of people, and we think about a broader way, uh, a broader ways that people might engage with their devices, which then changes the way that they interact with what we put out there virtually. So after we have that mindset, I think it's beneficial to understand that a more accessible thing gets out of the way. I say that a fair amount of the time. Accessibility is often about getting the web out of people's way. It's about making sure that people with disabilities don't have barriers that are not at all like, and yet are very similar to, if not identical to, physical barriers to access. You, know, you think about a lack of curb cuts or buildings with multiple stories and no elevators. When we move to the virtual space, the same kinds of impacts are there. Again, the barrier is different, and I'll speak to some more specifically here as we move a little bit further on in our time together. But really what we're aiming for is to get the web out of people's way. We want to provide greater equivalence of access to our digital spaces. And since those digital spaces are so much larger now, we in turn want to make sure that we are providing as much equivalence as we can to the opportunities that our digital spaces provide. I would say that accessibility in the virtual space as well as in the built environment gets us going toward inclusion. Accessibility and inclusion are different, but there's a dependency there. You can't very well have an inclusive digital space if it is not indeed accessible. And then I think that there's a parallel again between digital and physical spaces when we think about the harm that's caused by a lack of accessibility. Now I say, I will often phrase things as more accessible as opposed to completely accessible, because I think that looking at accessibility as a thing that we will always work toward is maybe more helpful than thinking of it as a thing we're going to finish. Our technology is always going to change, whether it is all at once in two weeks or it is a more planned out and careful change over time. Our technology is consistently and constantly going to change. More accessible is more achievable. Fully accessible might be a possible thing to do in the digital space, but I will say that it's usually not. And it can intimidate you as an individual or your organization to a point where you just don't do anything. It's so daunting to think about your entire virtual environment, whether you're in a, a large or small organization, you might have, uh, even a small organization might have a lot of digital stuff. So instead of thinking about, let's get to 100% accessibility, we want to take steps, which I'll talk about a little bit more here later on. We want to get started. And what we find too is that in reality, even if WebAIM does an evaluation on a website and we say it's accessible as of this day, the next day there's likely to be something that pops up and makes it not completely accessible anymore. And it's also important in this conversation to remember that there are a wide range of impacts that an inaccessible part of a website can have. Some things might be annoying to a screen reader user. Others might keep somebody who just uses a keyboard to navigate the web from being able to do anything at all. And that's, again, one of the reasons that I general, generally talk about trying to make things more accessible. So for someone who uh, is, is blind or has a form of uh, low vision, there are several things that the web can break. 
on screen on this left hand side, I've got this little screen snippet. And this has been zoomed to, I think, about 200% for this screenshot. And what we have is a situation where now we have text uh, stacked on top of text. We have some text that has been pushed out of the, the space that was allocated for it on the page. So it's not even visible. It's, it's not even readable to someone who has used this two to 300% zoom. And those of you in the AT space know that 200% isn't that high. On the right-hand side, um, we have a situation on Zoom that often happens where, again, you zoom in on the web page and you make somebody start to go on a scroll hunt. There's a, a, now, not only does someone have to scroll up and down to visually read the page, there's a new scroll bar across the bottom, which means that somebody's going to have to scroll left and right to be able to actually see the content on the page. So these are things that we don't want to do. These are things in the web that break the experience or that cause somebody to have to go to uh, potentially much greater lengths to be able to actually read what's there. For uh, carrying on into, this is a soapbox thing of mine, I'll try not to get on my soapbox, but uh, color contrast is a critical part of the web as well. And so on this left-hand side of the slide, we have some text on a dark gray background that's just a little bit lighter. It says this text is very hard to read because in fact it is. Now I can't, I'm not there in the room. I don't know what kind of projection uh, setup you have. I've used slides like this in the past where as soon as the slide comes on, it makes my point for me. The text has been in some cases completely invisible uh, because of the projector. Then on the right hand side, we have text that just says this text is much easier to read and it's white on this dark background. Uh, I've done website and um, PDF assessments for years now. And color contrast is one of the things that fails the most often. Uh, that, that tracks with data that WebAIM has, has kept over the years in terms of looking at website evaluation data and knowing that um, failed color contrast is very, very common. So that's why I have a soapbox that I'm not going to officially get out, but it's something that's really important. And it's something that many of you can uh, check for and can keep an eye out for as you're creating content at your desk. It doesn't matter, again, if you're working on the web or you're working in something like Microsoft Office, things like this are things that you can keep tabs on. And even better, Office in particular will help to check for it with its accessibility checker. Uh, there are a lot of features built into our authoring tools that help. Then there are things like this. This is a line graph. We have three series that are plotted here. We have a, a label on a blue line that says series one. Our series two line is red and our series three is green. So we've used color to communicate which data set is represented by which line. Well, that's an issue for a lot of folks, depending on different forms of low vision. Uh, maybe this is printed out on a black and white printer. And if we look at this in grayscale, you really can't tell which is which. Two of them are basically the same. So if all we use is color, we set ourselves up to create an environment where somebody can't actually consume the content that we have put out there. Now, there are multiple ways around this and tools like uh, those at Microsoft and Google will let you do things like I've done here on this third one, where I've just added a marker along each one of the lines. So now series one is still blue, but it also has a triangular shape at each data point. Series two is still red, but it has a diamond at each point, and series three is still green, but I've added a square shape. So what that does is it means that if we look at this in grayscale, we can still tell the difference from one line to the next. This is something that we see really commonly as well. And it's not just kept in the, the lane of visuals like this, charts or graphs or more complex data visualizations. It's also true when you type text. You don't want to emphasize text just by changing it to red or whatever color. You want to be sure that there's another visual indicator. The other note that I want to make is color is a great way to represent information. It's a great way to distinguish one thing from another. So I won't suggest that you not use color. It's just that when you do, use something else to help to distinguish, in this case, in this line graph, between the three different lines. So. The next piece that we need to think about is uh, folks that drive their experience using only a keyboard. 
they don't use a mouse, don't use a trackpad, um, and they use just a keyboard to navigate the web, to start apps, et cetera, et cetera. And the way that you can, you can check this, it's actually something you can do. You don't need any special tools. Uh, you just need a keyboard and you need to be able to navigate using the keyboard. It's helpful actually in accessibility testing to be able to see because there are a lot of visual cues to this. And if there are parts of a website that are not at all available to a screen reader, then if you're using a screen reader, many of you who use screen readers well know this, you're not going to know that that content is there. There are all kinds of ways that techie people can hide content from screen reader users and not even know it. In other words, it's visibly there on the screen, but a screen reader cannot reach it to announce it. So when we're talking about keyboard, we're actually talking about a pretty broad range of folks. It might be that somebody has a trimmer that makes using a mouse impractical or very time consuming, and a keyboard is the best way to go. A lot of folks using screen readers, if they're not using the touch screen on their device, they may well have a Bluetooth uh, keyboard that's attached, or if they're using a braille display, it'll send keyboard commands. So there are all kinds of people that, uh, for whom keyboard accessibility is really, really important. The way that you can, you can begin to check for this, and there's some nuance, so don't go back and take a look at your website, tab through it and declare it broken um, without doing a little bit more reading. But if someone can uh, tab, use the tab key on the keyboard to move through all of the things that you would normally interact with using a mouse, then it's at least a step toward keyboard accessible. If you overshoot something, let's say that you have a bunch of links on a web page you hit the tab key, you should go through them in an order that makes sense. You should be able to see uh, each one that you land on. And if you overshoot one, if you hold down shift and hit the tab key, you should be able to go back to it. And you should also be able to activate things like links and buttons just using the enter key, for example. Those are some quick tests. That's actually a fair amount of the effort that goes into uh, evaluating accessibility on modern websites because things can get very complex very quickly. And there are a lot of things that a trained evaluator needs to look for without ever using a mouse, just driving the experience from the keyboard. So next, if we think about someone who is deaf or hard of hearing, um, I'll, I'll drop this link into the chat. I should have it queued up <clears throat> for those of you who are on chat. But there are things like transcription for a podcast, for example. Um, the example that I have here, I actually may show everybody real quick. Let me just change my share. I think I'm just sharing. So I will, uh, I'll show this to you because NPR does a pretty good job of transcribing their podcasts and such. And so uh, if you go to their podcasts, you will find all kinds of examples. Um, I didn't pick this one for any particular reason. I, apparently it was an interview with Dua Lipa. So you've got the ability to listen to it audibly, but if you're deaf or hard of hearing, you should have a transcript available. So a transcript for strictly audio looks very much like this. We've got speaker identification. In this case, Rachel Martin is the host. And we have the little bit that she has said. And then when we kick over to an audio clip of Dua Lipa singing, there's a clip and it indicates that she's singing. And it's a lyric from one of her songs. So transcripts are, are key to access. And they're not something that should be done as an accommodation. That's the other point with accessibility that I should make. When we're talking about digital accessibility, as we do in the physical space, it's about making the environment accessible proactively. And I'll dig a little bit more into that later on, but it's a good time to make that point. So transcripts for things like podcasts, anything that is audio only um, are the way to go. On the right, of course, we have an example of uh, captioning. This is a, a YouTube caption from one of the videos about our evaluation tool. Um, and captions on YouTube, very similar to what you see uh, on broadcast television. Uh, now, oftentimes, they're, they're not done that well. If you let YouTube create captions automatically and you actually read them 
you're going to find mistakes, especially with spelling and grammar and uh, names, often name spellings. Uh, there are going to be some tricky things that you'll need to go in and fix. And it's really important to consider as well what kind of automatic captioning you have in a platform like Zoom. Human captions are humanly provided or created captions are always going to be a higher level of quality. But for your meetings, for your smaller events, take a look and see what Zoom actually does for you, um, what Teams does for you. They're not perfect, but the, the people, and this is anecdotal, not scientific, the folks I've talked to who are deaf or hard of hearing have said that it's a really, it's an improvement over the in-person meeting experience a lot of the time. If you're reading lips and you have a bunch of people talking, especially if people start talking over one another, um, folks are going to be worn out, uh, potentially not be able to track the conversation. Whereas if they're participating on Zoom and the captions are, are pretty close, that can be a better experience. And the other piece to keep in mind is what your platform does in terms of supporting ASL interpretation. Um, Zoom has refined a few things to make it so that uh, ASL is a little bit a little bit better than it was at first. You used to have a limit to how many people you could have visible in, on the screen at one time. And they've done some things to address that over the last few years. Uh, that's the one that I'm the most familiar with, but that's something that if you're going to begin to do like Signal Centers has done and stream a, an event out over a platform, search your platform name and ASL and, and make sure that there are uh, processes out there that lets you provide that as well. For someone that does indeed use a screen reader, there is this keyboard tie-in that I talked about before. Uh, it is really important to be sure that the keyboard can get to everything in the page because a lot of folks who use screen readers will drive their experience from the keyboard. But there's a lot of behind the screen kind of stuff. For those of you who are kind of familiar with the web, um, things like the way buttons and links are actually built are critical to making sure that someone who's using the keyboard only and who's using a screen reader can know what the button is and can actually trigger the button and they understand where the link is going to send them and they can actually activate the link. For those of us who create content, anytime you add an image into your, um, into your content, you need to be sure that you provide a text equivalent for it. You need to convey the intended meaning of the image and your authoring tool should let you do that. I say authoring tool, that makes it sound maybe fancier than it is, but if you're in Microsoft Word quite a bit, if you are in PowerPoint quite a bit, you can add something called alternative text to your images. And that's where you type a couple of sentences to convey the meaning that the image has. Also, if you're in Word or if you're writing content on the web otherwise, instead of just bolding your headings and making them a little bit larger font, if you have section headings in a document, it's, it's much better to actually use the heading styles that are built into those authoring tools. Uh, I don't know of too many that don't let you use headings anymore. It's really, really common, and it's something that you should be in the habit of doing. What all of these things do is they provide the behind the screen information that the screen reader needs in order to announce the right stuff to someone who's reading via that technology. So again, your text equivalent for a visual a screen reader won't try to interpret what a, an image looks like. Now, a quick note on uh, Microsoft Office, I think Facebook, there are other platforms that are trying to do this. They're touting their ability to automatically create alternative text, to automatically create this text equivalent. And it's not there yet. Generally, what you have when you let the platform write that for you is a description. But most of the time, your text equivalent is not just a description, right? So if you have a picture of a bird that has a, a fancy tail, you can use that image in a lot of different contexts. You might use it in an article about bird watching, and there you might describe the tail a little bit as a, a way to quickly identify that bird. If you're talking about state symbols, then that bird might be the state symbol of a particular state and your text equivalent will speak to that instead. So don't let the platform write this for you. Um, they're all pretty easy to go in and change. 
right there in the flow of your offering. Um, and it's a key thing to do to be sure that that text equivalent, that alternative text is actually valid. When I talk about heading styles, what using a heading style will do invisibly for those of you who are sighted looking at the screen, it will wrap up whatever text is in that heading in a little, basically a little heading package. And what happens is when the screen reader hits that bit of text, it'll announce the text and it'll also announce that it's a heading. And it will announce different numbers. Uh, headings are numbered so that you can organize your content and structure your content using the numbers on them. So it's a lot of stuff that happens back behind the screen that is critical for uh, that equivalence of experience to come in for folks who are using screen readers. So then how do you do this? Uh, I've talked about a lot of platforms. I think for a lot of organizations in particular, this can become daunting really quickly. Uh, because if you really sit down or stand up as you may choose, and you think through all of the technology that your organization is putting out there. And you think about technology, not just aimed outside of your organization, think about the technology that aims internally to those of you who work for the organization. Uh, that's a key part of this conversation as well. And it's one that often gets prioritized lower uh, because organizations, I think, just culturally are accustomed to providing accommodations for employees with disabilities. The goal to move toward accessibility in our technology really needs to include what's facing outside of the organization and the tools and platforms that you all work with on a regular basis within. And when you start to think through that, it can become very, very daunting very, very quickly. I've worked with organizations that we sat down and did an inventory of the technology that they provide. And this was actually pre-pandemic, the last time that I did it. We ended up uh, with a list, I think it was 25 or 30 different platforms. Some were relatively small, some were very, very large, some were relatively new, and some had been in place for quite some time. And what I saw was the organization, not, I couldn't see this directly, but I could get the sense that it was very intimidating. And that question of, well, now where do we even start is one that often does keep organizations from moving. So my advice is first start. And you can do that by looking at things that might be local to you. I'll show a, a couple of other resources here um, that WebAIM has had, and I'm not, I'm not selling WebAIM. These are resources that I've used for 11 years now that I've pointed to at WebAIM because uh, WebAIM has traditionally provided stuff that's really approachable, even on technical topics, it's pretty readable. Um, and understandable by human beings. And so that's why I'll point to that here. But we do have articles on, on using um, PowerPoint to create more accessible slides, uh, especially in, well, not especially, in any environment where you're providing training or you're teaching or an event like this, accessibility in your slides is a huge part of the presentation. Um, there are things that you should do during the presentation as well. I've, I've described the meaningful images uh, as I needed to throughout the talk. If there was one I didn't describe, it was really just reinforcing what I was saying otherwise. So there are uh, techniques that you can use in Microsoft PowerPoint to create more uh, accessible slides. Similar to that Microsoft Word, very much the same way. Um, and this gets into detail beyond what I mentioned as a few highlights. But this gets into the real nitty gritty of using Word to create more accessible documents, including creating PDFs from Word. And then it's the same with Excel. Uh, there are resources that we have and that Microsoft has about Excel. Uh, I do see a question in the chat. Is the PowerPoint available? Um, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll pose that question to the Signal Center's folks. I don't know if those are going to be published on uh, your site. If someone could jump in. While y'all are working on that, I'll, I'll continue. Um, and then in general, if you are a, a web professional, if you live more in the web space, we do have several articles about much more specific and technical pieces of accessibility. Um, but we also start out really at a high level with the impact that inaccessible technology has 
with uh, different kinds of disabilities as well. <clears throat> the other piece that I think is really, really important for organizations, maybe more so than individuals, is buying and using technology. Um, this comes back to hopefully having some time to slow down and plan a little bit more and a little bit more carefully and to look at what's working and to evaluate that quality. Um, it doesn't make sense to not account for accessibility when you buy something, spend money on it, and then find out that it has a bunch of barriers to people with disabilities. So whether you directly handle purchasing or your voice in decision-making processes, it's really important to talk about accessibility very early on, to bring that into the conversation as soon as you can. And with your existing things, it's something to catch up on and begin to account for with those platforms that are out there and available already. And so then on the Signal Center side, were the slides going to be published anywhere on your uh, site? We'll get that question answered. So more broadly, apologies, there's a street sweeper going down the street if there's some background noise. Uh, more broadly, it, at the organizational level, what we encourage organizations to do is to view accessibility as something that is an ongoing program. Uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier, kind of off the top, that accessibility isn't really anything that you finish. It's just something that you continue to work on. And that's because organizations will continue to deploy technologies. They will continue to uh, bring on new platforms, continue to find new ways to engage with people virtually. And so just in the same way that organizations will look at uh, security or privacy as ongoing programs, accessibility is the same way. It needs to be something that's built into what an organization does, built into decisions, not just about uh, purchasing, like I was just discussing, also about content, also about the things that we publish and the way that we engage with, with people out there in the virtual space, and again, with our own employees. So we look for the people who do technology, the doers that create. Many of you may well be uh, one of the doers who creates and uh, contributes to the digital space for your organization. Then you have a lot of folks that influence those decisions, that influence the direction of things. Um, if someone is in their marketing shop for their organization, well, marketing has a lot to do with brand colors and how those colors are used. So marketing might not create all of the web stuff or all of the digital things that are out there, but they're going to influence it by uh, publishing a color palette that people in the organization are either required or strongly suggested to use. There are other people that influence in more subtle ways that are key to this conversation as well. And I think it's helpful, it's helpful to keep in mind that for a lot of organizations, this could be just a fundamental culture change. I, I talked before about how, particularly in employment, many employers, if not most, are used to relying on a reactive accommodations-based model where with technology, what we're really asked to do is to do account for this from the beginning, account for accessibility from the start and not rely on reacting to the needs of an individual, whether they're within or again, outside of the organization. And that can be a, a fundamental change in the way that the organization collectively thinks, right? And I think that that's helpful to keep in mind for uh, larger conversations that you might have or that others might have. And I also think it's good to keep in mind when you have those smaller interactions where you kind of feel like you wanna crawl out of your skin because someone says, well, why would someone who's blind use our website? It's a very visual thing. Some of y'all might've heard that question. I've heard that question. Uh, it's paraphrased. People might've put the words in different order, but I don't hear that question while I do kind of get a little creepy crawly about it. I think that question and questions like it are going to come from a place where people just don't realize that number one, there are powerful assistive technologies that people with disabilities use regularly to navigate the web and interact with the physical world. 
And on the other side of it, there's a responsibility for those of us that contribute to technology to make sure that we are building that stuff and buying things that are accessible. And when you put those two together, there's no reason in the world that somebody with any disability shouldn't be able to interact with us virtually, again, as equivalently as possible to non-disabled peers. And so I do uh, just wanna let you all know about a free event that WebAIM is putting on. If you are interested in digital accessibility, in particular, we're running an online conference in September, September 7th and 8th, uh, it will be over Zoom. We are working on schedule and speakers and everything uh, as we speak. That's uh, gonna be probably the rest of my week, this week, pinning down speakers. But if you're interested in digital accessibility, we're gonna cover a lot of ground. We're gonna have sessions for more technical audiences, sessions for less technical audiences. Really looking forward to it. Uh, you can find the information at conference.webaim.org if you're interested, um, but we're excited to be able to put that on. I see a question. And did y'all wanna read the questions out loud? Rob, this is Sandy Lambert with Signal Centers. We're gonna keep checking the chat. Um, and if anybody here in the in-person auditorium at Chattanooga State has a question, just flag me down. All right, we've got a question. A question from Ezra, I'll hold the mic for you. Could you give us a good example of uh, the right description for alternate text and about how long it should be? Yeah, so uh, the, the first answer is everyone's favorite, the least favorite answer. It depends entirely on the image meaning in that context. Uh, the way that I, I tell people to maybe think about it, and hopefully this is helpful when it comes to what should you put into alternative text is, think back to before everything was um, a, a voice call where you could see people uh, or have at least that option. Think back to just a plain old voice call. If you were reading that content, what would you say when you got to the image? That can be a helpful way to figure out what kind of content to put into the alternative text. As far as the length, there's not a hard and fast character cutoff. You will hear people say that it's not really true. Um, my advice, our advice is you wanna keep it as concise as possible. For the most part, if someone's using a screen reader and they get to a really long piece of alternative text, they're liable to just move on to the next piece of content. Um, and if you do need a longer bit of text in order to fully convey the meaning of an image, for a number of your readers, it's gonna be helpful to have that maybe in the narrative, in the document. Um, if you have an image that you are describing and it's a very detailed image, then it can be helpful for people with different learning styles to have that in the narrative. Uh, as a rule of thumb, I tell people when they get to the end of a second sentence, typing alternative text, to start to think about how long is this actually going to be? And it does look like there's a question in the chat. And that's, a, uh, so the question is, given the overwhelming numbers of colors offered in the digital environment, could you talk a little bit about how to work with colors when dealing with visual disabilities, in particular with those relying mostly on voice output? Um, so by voice output, um, a clarifying question, do you mean a screen reader in particular or some uh, something like Read Write Gold or even like Adobe's Read Aloud that will let you uh, put a visual cue over words and sentences as it reads? Um, to the point about working with colors in general, um, the bit about not just using color to convey meaning is a key one. Um, so if you do use color to differentiate things in a pie chart or data viz, data visualization, then um, you want to be sure that you're adding another visual cue to distinguish things from one another. With color contrast, there are a number of tools that you can use to check color contrast. Microsoft Office has built quite a bit into I know at least Word and PowerPoint, those are the two that I use the most frequently. And um, they're pretty good. Uh, they do a pretty good job when you have text on a background, if it's plain text that you've typed in. They can't check color contrast for text in images. 
Um, if you hop onto the webaim.org site uh, and look for our color contrast checker, you can use it to check contrast on anything. Um, it'll also, uh, it'll let you enter, if you're in the early design phase, you can use a little eyedropper to grab a color swatch and you can drop in a foreground and a background color. And color contrast is something that is pretty much pass fail at this point with the current web standards. I'm not suggesting they're perfect because there are some combinations that pass color contrast uh, measurements that are really difficult to read. And there are others that are easier to read that fail, but those are usually edge cases. Um, so use the tools that are, are built into the authoring environments. You can use our tool. There are other really good color contrast checkers that you can find out there on the web. Um, and then when you talk about colors with visual disabilities uh, for folks using screen readers, if, uh, if someone is just using a screen reader and can't see the screen, then that's where, oh, your, your text equivalent is going to come in and be really important. Uh, for things like that line graph that I showed, I might write uh, just a brief bit of text um, that describes the trends of the free series, something like that. Um, otherwise, you're still really relying for someone who has low vision and might still use a screen reader or someone that uses a screen reader that uh, can still see the screen. You're relying on accounting for color contrast and you're relying on uh, that notion of not just using color to convey meaning. Um, but color, color is tricky. And as I said, it's a really, really common error that we find when we do website evaluation. Anyone else? We have another question from a person in our audience. You want to say hi? Introduce yourself. I'll hold it. All right. Hey, my name is Connor. Um, thank you for this talk. I wanted to ask, there's a lot of people talk about uh, visual disabilities when it comes to website design. But one thing I haven't heard much about is talking about uh, motor disabilities and what sort uh -huh. of things you would do uh, to be accessible to people with out fine motor skills either. Do you have any uh, pointers for those? Yeah, absolutely. And, and on the web site, we've got a ton that aims at a more technical audience. So I, I've kind of got two separate answers. If you're using Microsoft Office, there, it's harder to break a lot of the stuff that you would expect. Um, so if you're using, say, Dragon Naturally Speaking, or if you're using a keyboard to navigate, then Office stuff um, is generally going to be pretty good um, from the content side. You can still break it as a content author. It's, it's harder. When you get out to the web, um, that's where stuff can really get broken. And that becomes a more technical conversation. It becomes more about making sure that if you're a web designer, um, you're using natural HTML stuff. Uh, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of ways to make a link. Uh, those, those who aren't in the tech space might not know this, but um, there are a lot of different ways to build a link. You can just use an HTML link, which has its own structure and its own meaning and its own attributes and elements. And a, a properly put together HTML link, which is pretty easy to do in the tech space, is going to work just fine. Um, it's going to respond the way that you would expect from the, um, the speech input perspective or from the keyboard. Uh, there are a couple of things to make sure that you do if you create a link. Um, ideally, you create link text that is descriptive. You don't just use the website address. So if you have, um, oh, like the couple of links in the slides to Microsoft Word, uh, I just linked the word Word at that point, as opposed to having the full link to our web address. Um, but that does become more kind of behind the screen techie kind of stuff, especially if people start to build links from scratch, basically. Uh, so that conversation kind of quickly becomes pretty technical. And there's a lot of variability, Connor, in the authoring platforms and how they serve up these things that, um, that you may be trying to, to work with that may or may not be accessible. So it's tricky to get into it in a lot of detail um, because I think for most folks, they're going to be relying on the actual, um, the actual structure in the platform that they're using, and they may not be able to influence that. Rob, this is Sandy Lambert with Signal Senders. We've got another question that's come in. I'll just, I'll read it. Chattanooga hosts Project Voice every year, one of the biggest voice technology conferences in the country. How are assistants like Alexa being utilized? 
A lot of different ways. I will say that that's a little bit outside of my my expertise on the digital side. Um, my experience is primarily with web and uh, that Microsoft stuff I was talking about. Um, but I know anecdotally very heavily. Um, I think from the accessibility side, it's come a long way. I think there were some things in Alexa and some of the other voice assistants that weren't stellar when they first came out. Um, but like a lot of other platforms and vendors, I think they have improved. Um, but I, I, I'm not the best to answer, uh, pardon me, to answer that in a lot of detail. Okay, here's another question for you. Have there been any surprises for you as a professional in the AT field? You know, any, any technology or anything you didn't expect to see? Um, so I'm not on the AT side as much as I am the web accessibility side. That said, uh, well, I mean, what wasn't surprising about the pandemic, but one of the surprises that did come out of the pandemic is accessibility really did, digital accessibility, what I've just been talking about, uh, it had a little bit more of a limelight put on it over the last, and it has had for the last couple of years. Now, I alluded to that before. I think that was a surprise. When, when everything shut down two years ago, I was working for the Assistive Technology Act program here in Oklahoma, um, and we didn't know what to expect. Uh, we knew that it was going to be a stretch for state agencies and institutions that we worked with to do a lot about accessibility in that two weeks or month when everything went online. But subsequent to that time since then, um, I think that's a piece that has surprised me. So um, yeah, that's a very kind of general thing. But I think that's, that's something that I would not have anticipated a couple of years ago. We're still not there, I will say that. Um, we, we have data, WebAIM has for years now done a pretty big accessibility survey uh, across the web. And we know we're not there yet, but um, it's great to see so many companies really start to put more emphasis on accessibility, writing accessibility into job descriptions for people that aren't just web designers. Uh, I've seen a lot, a lot more emphasis on accessibility um, since everything's been online in the way it has. And I think we've seen more gaps, people with disabilities have pointed out more gaps in accessibility. So that's been an interesting, uh, an interesting trend. Um, it does look like we're at time. I know there are a couple of questions hanging and I apologize, but uh, we are at time. Uh, I wanna thank you all so very much for your engagement. Thank you again to Signal Centers for having me. Uh, really appreciate it and hope that the rest of the event is fantastic. And I forgot to say this off the top, happy Global Accessibility Awareness Day, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you.